Salam sejahtera and a good day. Welcome to the topics on research methods. First, let's look at what is research. Research is defined as a systematic process of collecting and analyzing information to increase the understanding on a question or phenomenon under study. And of course, research is not only looking at new things, it is also looking at the same set of findings, but from a different perspective. It is often important to remember that when you are doing research, you must look at it with an open mind. That means open to all possibilities or things that you have never thought about. So in this discussion, we'll be looking at the key elements of research, the research process, and of course, planning of research programs itself. What are the key steps in the research process? Number one is of course, to identify research focus. Number two, characterize the variables. Number three, determine the appropriate research designs and viable sample size. Number four, organization of resources and conducting the study. Number five is the data collection itself. Number six, screening of the collected data. Number seven, data analysis and interpretation. And lastly, writing up the research findings itself. Let's look at number one. When we identify research focus, it is important for us to identify the subject matter to be investigated. What will be the objectives and what will be the hypothesis? Objectives are actually solutions to the problems that you have raised or identified to be researched. And hypothesis will be the hypothesized outcome, anticipated outcome of the solution. And then of course, Every research cannot run away from key determinants, key factors, and of course, measurable factors that we typically term as variables. And all this needs to be put in an organized manner. And this is actually where we characterize our variables. This more or less explain how variables are interrelated or explain each other. For example, how increases in the dosage of drug improve the health condition of the animal, or for example, in this case, how increases in dosages of NSAIDs relief help the animal to have better pain relief. Once all these are determined, it is important to arrange all these treatments and all these variables as well as the subjects in the organizable, organizable manner so that we can measure them effectively. So in order to do this, we need to have a thorough understanding of sampling theory. And there would be commonly used methods in the particular field. If you're working in animal science, you could be using larger number of animals versus if you're working in theodogenology, which typically uses only one or two bulls. And in order to determine what will be the sample size that are acceptable, you may have to calculate the effect size and test power. And this can be done using formulas, softwares, and sample size charts, which we'll cover later. So the next phase will be organization of resources and conducting the study. If let's say the study has not been conducted before and we are not sure of how it would turn out, it will be prudent to conduct a pilot trial. And sometimes in order to apply for animal ethics clearance, you may be asked to conduct a pilot trial just to ascertain whether the study will work as intended. To put things in perspective, this is actually how the entire research process can be looked at when you put, in, put it into a flowchart. It all depends on general ideas. So where do you get a general ideas from? You can only get general ideas about research is actually when you have accumulated enough materials in terms of understanding of the topic that and reading through the review of literatures, discussions, and of course, requirements of the study. In this case, we're talking about your final project or maybe a master's or PhD project. So it becomes important for you to look for a starting point and a best starting point will be recommendations from past studies, as you can see from uh, published research articles or published theses of your seniors. And this will actually lead you to be able to form a research focus. A research focus is actually a problem or a topic that you want to investigate. It is always said, often said that research focus starts with a problem statement. A problem statement is a problem that you want to solve. And these problems should be important, should be well justified. And it, because it defines the subject matter to be investigated, 
It also forms the objective to be investigated. In this case, remember objectives will be the solution to the problem statement that you post just now. And of course, all this can only be solved by identifying the necessary factors and measurable variables. As we have already looked at just now, these variables needs to be characterized. That means we need to know how they are interrelated or explain each other. And be open to options whereby some of these variables may, it may on the outset seem unrelated to each other, but in actual fact, they are related to each other. And these variables can further be broken down into either they are parametric or non-parametric based on their data distribution. Having said all that, it is important for us to calculate sample size. Throughout this course, we could be using uh, softwares and methods to calculate the relevant sample size or variable sample size so that the study that you formulated is actually trustable and with uh, enough scientific validity to be presented to the general audience. And uh, of course, you have formulation or hypothesis, meaning that you know what to expect from our trials. We shall be covering hypothesis in maybe lecture three or lecture four. And like what I mentioned earlier, organize the necessary resources and running the trial. It should always be remembered that there's not always not enough data for research. You'll realize this at the annual study. You could have recalled, it could have been better if you collected that data and this data. Whereas during the, form, during the planning stage, you may, it may seem that the data will be overwhelming. And of course, after you collected a data, it is important for you to screen and clean the data for errors. Errors could be unintentional or sometimes due to instrumentation issues. Once the data is clean, then and only then it can be subjected to data analysis and interpretation. Once it has been interpreted, interpreted, interpreted it becomes important for us to write up and report the results. And I would urge everybody to take a simplistic approach to report the results. Don't be too ambitious. Always remember that one interpretation can be translated into one fact or one point, and that will make your management of data and their results, and of course, the subsequent interpretation of results more manageable. Otherwise, it may seem overwhelming with the avalanche of data and of course, various degrees of interpretation, plus all kinds of points that you have picked up throughout your literature search and review. And it may seem very, very overwhelming, but if you can put everything in perspective in an organized piecemeal manner, all this is of course going to be easier for you. So how to write discussion? So as in this particular section, you can see that this is actually a trial and tested method for uh, my students to write discussion. There are four steps. The first step will be general results commentary on trends and outstanding individual results. Remember, you are writing each of this for each point that you have already figured out or analyzed in your results. So every results, every point of results will result in these four steps. You can see if you go through these four steps, you can quickly have a paragraph comprising of 50, 60 words or even more. And once you have that, it will allow you to organize your discussion in a more uh, um, uh, comprehensive manner. And by writing all this discussion in a paragraph together, it will actually allow you to gather your thoughts easily. And of course, facilitate uh, anybody who marks your thesis or who marks your write-up to present the comments pointedly according to what you are talking about. And of course, in the final write-up, it is often important for you to try to mix or break up some of these paragraphs so that it will improve the flow of the entire uh, results report. So now let's get back to these four steps. The first step will be general results commentary on trends and outstanding individual results. The second one will be statement of agreement or statement of conformance. Following that will be statement explaining the reasons why you see an agreement. And of course, we cannot be one-sided. The next phase will be a statement of disagreement whereby we talk about results that did not agree with our current findings. And the following to that will be to explain why these results disagree with our current finding. Finally, this is actually where we, you, uh, you write your discussion. Remember that when you are writing a thesis, you are actually trying to defend your thesis. 
you are not writing an audit report where you expose everything. No, you are writing a thesis to be defended. So all arguments should be constructed in a sequential and logical manner to support your results. So number four is actually where concluding after cross-examining points that put forth in statement of agreement and statement of disagreement, you are still convinced that the current results are valid. And this is actually where you state your point. The following slides will actually state how these examples can be taken. So you can see this is actually an example result on pain relief and dosage of treatment using NSAIDs. There are four results here. So we shall be talking about only one result that are one point of results that, that can arise from here. You can see there in general comment, results showed that increasing NSAID dosage results in better pain relief and a maximum efficacy of 50 milligram per kilogram. And drug X showed the best effects as earlier reported by uh, A et al, 2019. So this is actually a statement that you can comment after looking at the results. And bear in mind, A et al is actually a prior reference that you use. And of course, when you move on to conformance statement, you can also say that your results are being backed up by the earlier study, in this case, B and C 2018. And you need to explain why this conformance is all about. Likewise, we move, when we move on to discordance, you need to report that there are contradictory results. Make sure that when you report contradictory results, you have explanation for contradictory results. Otherwise, it may make it very, very difficult when you want to synthesize the results. So what will be the outcome? Your statement after reviewing all arguments for and against your studies will sound as the statement in this particular box. The current results showed that the drug is suitable for pain relief in adult candidates at 50 milligram per kilogram, as reported by earlier work. Rapid metabolism and poor excretion are the major reasons leading to signs of toxicity observed in younger candidates and the rodent model as reported earlier. However, none of the signs of toxicity were observed among adult candidates used in the current trial. This further underlined the safety and utility of this NSAID for pain relief at the indicated dosages for the, at the current trial. So these are just example how you use your results, mesh it with uh, the, the previous findings and come to your own conclusions. The next question will be in any research will be how extensive your study should be. Now, let me put this in perspective of your current degree. If you're talking about your final project, we should be looking at the, perspe the pro perspective of presenting a study in the degree level. So looking at these three layers, you can see that for degree, you are actually required to describe observed events, minimal explanation of mechanisms, processes involved. However, if you are moving up to a master's study, you should be describing the observed events detailing how and what happened. And some explanation of mechanism processes will be involved. The studies are typically horizontal, meaning that you are looking at factors that are on the surface. And going deeper is actually where you can gear your studies for a PhD study. In PhD studies, you are supposed to be describing observation, detailing why, how, and what happened. The why is actually a key factor. And it is mandatory for you to explain mechanisms or processes involved in detail. Studies are typically vertical. That means they go very, very deep. So in, in essence, this is actually what you should be mindful of when you structure a study. Not too deep because it will consume extensive amount of time and resources and which may not commensurate with the time that you put in if you are doing a bachelor's degree. And of course, it should be deep enough if you are gearing for a higher degree. 